This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Believe it or not, I just found out that the very phrase Far East was coined by Cardinal Newman in the 1840s. It's, uh, an authority is the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> and Newman was describing the so missionary sojourns of Francis Xavier and came up with the term Far East. Before him, in English language, we used to call it the Extreme Orient, from which I come. <laughs> the title of my paper is The Jesuits and the Cicero of China, Ma Shangbo and the Development of Chinese Higher Education. Uh, another way of putting it would be how a former Jesuit took China a step forward. I can do no more than to give you a prosopography uh, of this person. And please feel free to be distracted by the plethora of monotone pictures and the spaghetti of dry texts up here. So, who is Ma Shangbo? He was one of the first Chinese Jesuit priests to be ordained after the society's re-entry into China in 1842. At the age of 12, like the child Jesus absconding from his parents, Ma traveled alone to Shanghai and spent the next 24 years growing up with the Jesuits first as a pupil at the newly founded Collège des Saint-Ignans, then as a seminarian, and finally a priest. All within the Jesuit stronghold of Tsi Ka Hui, southwest of Shanghai, which was entrusted to the predominantly French Jesuits of the Paris province. Ma received a thorough classical education, learning Latin, French, and classical Chinese literature, but he took a special interest in natural sciences and mathematics. This particular interest in maths is important because later on in life, Ma often criticized the lack of logical thinking as one of the major drawbacks or shortcomings in tra traditional Chinese culture. At this college, Ma studied Matteo Ricci's The True Meaning of the Lord of Heaven. This book is not just a straightforward exposition of Catholic doctrine, but a methodological, apologetical, yet friendly and respectful dialogue between Christian beliefs and the enlightened Chinese mind. This broad, accommodating, gentle, modo, suave approach of Ritchie largely formed Ma Shangbo's religious and educational outlook. Ma's classical training with the Jesuits, governed by the Ratio Studiorum, also made him thoroughly enthused with Aristotle and Cicero, not to mention Thomas Aquinas. Later on in life, when Ma flexed his muscle at, at, as an orator, whether to preach, to pacify, negotiate, to galvanize a crowd, or to lambast his foes for church or for country, his speeches and writings were always marked by clear thinking fighting Ciceronian rhetoric, thus the nickname Cicero of China, but most importantly, atomistic confidence in the God-given power of rational human nature. The primacy of conscience uh, had a major role in uh, Ma's later writings. Ma was ordained a priest in 1870 and was soon appointed prefect of studies and later principal of his alma mater, Collège de Saint-Ignace. but clashes with authority surfaced at once. One time his superiors chided him for donating family funds to aid victims of natural disaster, seeing it as not in keeping with the vow of poverty. Many fruits of his academic labor, especially translations of mathematical and scientific work, were shoved aside. More so, there were various instances in which he and his brother, also a Jesuit, had been subjected to inferior treatment in favor of foreign colleagues. Eventually, a multiplicity of factors drove Ma to quit religious life altogether in 1876. It is rather sad that despite attempts to ameliorate the soured relationship, Father Ma, so gifted yet strong-willed, was quickly denounced as a fugitive, an apostate, a lost sheep. The word begins, I'm quite relieved that Father Nicholas is not here. Okay. So, <laughs> some, some writings from 
be correspondence between the superiors of Shanghai and the superior generals of the time were not very kind, I would say, with, with, with regard to Mao. And uh, his desertion from the Jesuits was deemed more lamentable than the persecution of infidels on a mission. Marshal Bo's departure sent shockwaves through the entire chain of command from Shanghai to Paris all the way to the Jesuit Curia. It triggered a radical review of policy and attitude towards the admission of Chinese students into the society. Now, could the internal motive of the Ma brothers' departure be some kind of an inferiority complex in face of French hubris? Well, Marshal Bo was reported to have said, I have never been a French member of the society, and if you want me to be one, I'd rather not be a member at all. Psychological disgruntle aside, there was a bigger picture. Throughout the years of the studies in Sika Hui, under the shroud of the French protectorate, China was being literally eaten up from within and without, suffering from internal corruption of the Manchurian dynasty and from foreign invasion. The Ma brothers were broad-minded intellectuals with a generous heart, who could not stand idle and not give over the talents to salvaging their country on the road to perdition. National salvation then became the driving spirit animating the Ma brothers' subsequent political and <coughs> educational endeavors. Unfortunately, we don't have time to review their secular accomplishments in detail. I just want to highlight Marshall Angor's visit to Oxford and Cambridge, where he noted the prevalence of Greek and Latin plays on campus, and their emphasis on classical literary education, in contrast with American universities where practical or empirical sciences receive more attention in the curriculum. The Ma brothers became convinced that China must reform itself through an intelligent appropriation of Western tradition and technology. As a Jesuit provincial once observed, the dream of these two brothers has always been to try to contribute to bringing China up to speed with the sciences of Europe. But my take is that the Ma brothers were not simply naive copycats infatuated with everything Western. You would never see Ma Shangbo dressed in suit and tie, for example. They were too smart for that. In fact, what they were really driving at is to reshape the Chinese mind so as to revitalize Chinese tradition with the aid of Western methodological reasoning. An illustration of this new modus cogendi would be their joint publication, The Mass Grammar, which is the first comprehensive analysis of Chinese syntactical structure in modern history. It was obvious that their scholastic training as Jesuits made such project possible. In 1895, Ma's devout Catholic mother, like St. Monica, died, still hoping for the conversion of his wayward ex-priest son to full communion with the church. And finally, frustrated over the inept effort in serving a crumbling Manchurian empire, Ma Shambo resolved to lead the life of a penitent in semi-retirement back with the Jesuits in Sikawe in Shanghai. But what followed instead was a 40-year-long campaign dedicated to Christianizing China, to Chinesing the Catholic Church, and to saving the soul of the nation through education. At that time, he was already 60 years old and uh, was a widower. He entrusted his young pair, young pair of children to the church and lived on the third floor of this orphanage. <laughs> Two months ago, uh, after regular Sunday Mass with the Chinese Catholic community in Bethnal Green, uh, I came across this uh, elderly but spirited lady from Shanghai. I said, oh, how nice. I'm going to Shanghai this summer to celebrate the 100th uh, birthday of the granddaughter of Ma Shangbo. And then she said, Ma Shangbo, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That Ma Shangbo. My grandfather was an orphan who grew up in Tusan Wan, and uh, Ma Shangbo so appreciated his talents in wood carving that he gave, sponsored him uh, with 40 pieces of silver and started uh, the most successful lumber business in the region. 
My grandmother also used to work for the Ma family until the communists took over. I, mean, I dropped my jaw and almost <laughs> cried with joy. Of, of all places in Hackney, <laughs> I made a descendant of a family who owed a faith and livelihood to Ma Shambo, the philanthropist and educator. Aspiring intellectuals, especially those who would later become colossal figures in China's reform movements, flocked to the Sika Wei and begged Ma to teach them Latin so that they could understand Western culture from within, so to speak. At age 64, Ma decided to donate his fortune to the church to set up an academy of higher learning aimed at educating Chinese scholars to meet the needs of a new China. Ma had the intuition that the old pedantic imperial system of Chinese civil service examination would soon be abolished. So he wanted to have a new form of education in place to accommodate this historic change. He sought support from the Jesuits, but the initial response to Ma's initiative was dubious, to say the least. In fact, nobody believed it would work. My French is not that good, but I think the last sentence says, uh, his request was well, became a laughing stock. Nobody believed it in the fly. Notwithstanding the cold reception, Ma went ahead and picked the name Aurora, Zhen Dan in Chinese, for the school, which symbolized the Orient and the dawn of a new day. Ma encouraged democracy and student self-governance. He laid down three principles for this new academic institution. First, esteem for science. Second, emphasis on literature and arts. His pedagogy, uh, well, Ma, first of all, abhorred rote learning. His pedagogy, rather, was to make sure the students have a firm grasp of the rudiments of spelling and pronunciation. Which would, which would facilitate later autodidactic exploration. He was in favor of what today we might call the Great Books Program, exposing students to masterpieces of Cicero and Shakespeare, with the hope that students would work on translations of Western books. Mars' proficiency in the modern languages was instrumental in bridging the gap between China and the Western world. He didn't have to wait for those often haphazard publications of translations before he could quickly transmit advanced knowledge to his students. But the first, third and most daring principle for Aurora is this. No discussion of doctrine. No catechetical discourse. Instead, he organized public debates on current affairs on Sunday mornings. This no religion policy may seem radically liberal at first sight, but in reality, it shows great sensibility on Ma's part. Because he was aware that the provision of education, especially in the French protectorate, could easily be misconstrued as a means of conversion or proselytization, which would directly defy Ma's intention of attracting and helping promises scholars regardless of creed and cult. My great-grandfather and his student helped founded a Chinese school for Chinese students to learn English in Hong Kong. It was it's called Yan College. And later on, they, they're all Catholics, these founders. And uh, the Bishop of Hong Kong said, oh, why don't we invite the Irish Jesuits to help you teach English? Uh, so they did. Uh, but the founders' original idea is Again, no religious instructions for fear of giving the impression that we're using education as a means of just gaining same souls. <laughs> so my, my grandfather and his students all uh, uh, left school in bad blood, really, and became a farmer. <laughs> and, uh, here I quote, deeply influenced by his own rigorous Jesuit education and also his Chinese background, Ma designed a curriculum which reflected both the emphases of Jesuit education and his desire to transform Western knowledge into a Chinese cultural framework. The model that Ma chose was an academy in the classical Athenian sense, 
where mature scholars can gather, learn, and develop thinking philosophically, like in ancient Greece and China. The overall goal was to inculturate, not to indoctrinate, to foster independent, critical thinking, and not to train pen pushers. Too bad we don't have time to go through Ma's unique curriculum for Aurora. We'll save that for Heathrop's 500th anniversary. <laughs> but just very quickly, since I, it took me great pains to find this in Rome, so you see a literature, philosophy, dead languages, living languages, that is Latin, Greek, and then uh, French and English. Ethics. Mathematics, natural sciences. Oh, one interesting thing is, uh, although you can see it's Ars Gymnastica, but what it actually means, in reality, what, what they um, provided was military training. <laughs> <laughs> the Jesuits gradually warmed up to the idea of Aurora and began to see the viability of this project. They were willing to invest more manpower and resources. However, some fathers still could not get over Ma's complex background and remained a bit suspicious about him. But in my opinion, this sentiment is slightly ironic because after all, Ma Shambo was the kind of super erudite Renaissance man that the society themselves have created. And I would add that it's precisely thanks to Ma's departure from the society, plus, he, plus his 20 odd years of globe tracking, that we owe this joint venture between Ma and Jesuits in ushering a new era of Chinese higher educational reform. Everybody still looks rather content in this picture, but who knows what's going on in their mind. <laughs> so Ma Sheng was seat, seated at the middle. It is not surprising, though, that the Jesuits started to grow uneasy about a secular school being loosely run by an ex-priest on their grounds. They were worried that the kind of revolutionary-minded students whom Ma had harbored in the school would spell trouble. My great-grandfather used to teach English in uh, La Salle, uh, Irish La Salle College in Hong Kong during the Qing Dynasty. He was one of those <laughs> revolutionary gaga types. So. They demoted him just to become a clock. <laughs> Nevertheless, the Jesuits saw this as a golden opportunity of evangelization and of harnessing the talents of these bright scholars. So the fathers gradually took over the management of the academy. But then troubles set in. The students protested against the French Jesuits' growing interference in the democratic administration. They also resisted the religious influence that the Jesuits were beginning to exert. More so, it turned out the students wanted to learn English rather than French. So a mass exodus ensued, and the students founded a new school, which is now the prestigious Fudan University, and managed to persuade their old master, Marshambo, to be its principal. The Jesuits reopened Aurora after a hiatus, but it was no longer run according to the ideals that Ma had originally envisioned. Back in Aurora, already under the full Jesuit management, and having adopted the counter-reformation hero and catechist St. Peter Canisius as its patron, it became a self-styled French university in China, catering to a more career-geared student clientele who wanted to be trained as lawyers, doctors, and engineers with, with French academic credentials. Uh, I'm, thank, I'm thankful for uh, Christian for having mentioned St. Joseph University of Beirut, which was also under the Paris uh, province. And uh, when you looked at the curricula, you can see a lot of uh, similarities and parallels among them. Aurora's prestige and success was followed by another Jesuit university called the Institut des Hautetudes et Commerciales, built within the British concession territory in Tianjin. This emerged to become the top private university in northern China. It had one of the most advanced natural science museums, uh, where the Jesuit uh, Teja de Chardin made his name. 
Meanwhile, Fudan, that splintered off from Aurora, achieved high level of academic freedom and brilliant scholarship, but it, in general, did not follow Mao's original ideals. It basically followed a utilitarian agenda aimed at training students well-versed in industrial and commercial skills. And this is the line from the university anthem. Academic independence, freedom of thought, unencumbered by the entangling web of politics and religion. There, there he is, Ma Shang Bo, and he's seated in the middle with uh, uh, age 96, the graduates of Fudan. The rest of Ma's life from this point on was marked by yet more attempts at national salvation, especially at the critical juncture of the birth of the Republic in China. But the three main major contributions to the course of higher education in this last leg of his life were being appointed president of Peking University. He sent in a request to Pope Pius X to the Holy See to establish a Catholic university in Peking, and the proposal of a national Chinese academy based on the model of the L'Académie Française. In fact, he, he, he was able to gather those 40 famous amortels, uh, chinois, <laughs> to form this uh, academy, but uh, late, it later folded because nobody had was, was up, to, up to par to that kind of foresight and, and uh, uh, avant-garde thinking that Ma uh, had. When the American Benedictines finally started the Catholic University of Peking, also now known as Fu Yan University in Taiwan, uh, Ma acknowledged the place of theology in its curriculum. It's a huge contrast from back in those days in Aurora. Where, where he implemented a no religion policy. Now he asserts that both theology and science are based on God's orderly universe, and both are able to demonstrate the one true source of those things. It's an interesting contrast to what Christian has just said about Americans, because that, uh, Ma was in favor of having the Americans to run this, run this university because they had least uh, uh, colo colonial interests in China compared with other European forces. Uh, Mars generously took up the fight against the Japanese army with his pen rush. Let me just add his granddaughter uh, cried during an interview saying how he witnessed his grandfather writing those calligraphies day in, day out, sell them, auctioning them, giving them to people to, to encourage people to, to stand up against the Japanese. He, he would stand writing that whole day until he couldn't do it anymore. <coughs> he died in Vietnam as a refugee, as uh, aged 100. That's his famous quote, I'm a dog barking for 100 years and still haven't managed to wake China up. <coughs> a brief evaluation. Ma's ideals were a tall order. Some scholars are of the opinion that his life was simply a succession of failures uh, due to a combination of adverse factors. But I would rather see it from another perspective. Throughout his multiple attempts at developing the best form of education for a new China to train critically minded people to navigate through the muddled water of crises and natural disasters, one can discern a general movement from a more Cartesian, rationalistic attitude towards education at the beginning, such as back in those days in Aurora in Shanghai, to a more humanistic, integral approach that goes beyond cultural idiosyncrasies aiming at transcendence. And as he grew older, his mature religious fervor led him to realize that it is only by hearkening back to the spiritual roots of Catholic faith and morality that a nation could truly be educated and saved, at maiorem dei gloriam. The Ignatian ethos and Matteo Ricci's pioneering spirit were never lost on Marchambo, who, in my opinion, lived and died a Jesuit at heart. Thank you. Thank you.
you very much. Yes, and I'm sure there are some questions that there's time for. There's time for a few. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Please be lenient with your questions. I'm uh, only a student, you see. <laughs> Yes, it's visit to Europe, yes. I would say, uh, actually he was on business tour. His, he was tasked to borrow money from the States. And the uh, <laughs> problem is it was so successful that it, 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 he, he was able to get 10 times more than expected. So <laughs> and the Qing government said that's something fishy there. And said they, they didn't accept the loan. The influence uh, uh, is tremendous because all that he had learned in theory in, in, in Shanghai and, uh, and the matching it with reality was, uh, was critical because it then gave him a, a direct contact with how things were done. The praxis was laid out before him. And most importantly is he was very keenly aware of the difference between Europe and America. So he, he, he did when he say the West, there's the certain nuance to add to it. And he was able to try to incorporate the best of both worlds. Thank you so much for that. Uh, he's a very, very interesting man. Could you say a bit more about what his actual change in mentality was in his final years? Mm -hmm. And um, is there anything written for people in English about him? Mm. Yes. Uh, in 1935, he gave a speech that was recorded in a, this is a very rare contemporary English newspaper, uh, I mean, uh, this is a description of him in English. If we take a look at what he said here, these were things that you probably won't find in his earlier days. This is 1935, he said, uh, Marshall Moore spoke of intellectual apost apostolate on the perfection of thought and language as a valuable asset in propagating the faith. So, and the idols of paganism were dead deities, uh, influence of the past. He extolled the Catholic faith as something to instinct with life, concerning the living God, etc., etc. What, what I meant to say is that towards the end of his life, he became more Catholic, let me say. Because his apologia pro Catholica became more pronounced, his Catholic identity. His, his involvement with the Catholic Church in those days was, was, became uh, uh, much more deeply involved. And uh, there you can see in this picture to the, to the left is uh, Cardinal Eubin, lately, and, uh, and one of his nephews, Simon Zhu, a Jesuit, became the first Chinese Jesuit bishop in history. And, um, so his, his involvement with the church became more explicit, but um, he, uh, the, the Jesuits' role became a little bit uneasy because um, they really didn't know what to do with him. You know, he was one of us, now he's not one of us, but he is with intellectual prowess, outshining uh, everybody else. So, yeah. So we should yes, hear from us. Yeah. Introduction to a fascinating figure. Yeah. Once more. 